thank you for being here for this talk. The picture that you've been seeing all day is the picture of Peak, actually. So this this was one of them in the in the MSF setting. So MSF France has been working in Kutiala in Mali since 2009, and we have a pediatric project that has that focuses on curative care for under fives at hospital level, at health health center level, and in the community through community health workers. Um, a big part of the focus is on malaria, and another big part of the focus is on nutrition. Uh, we also do preventive care with a project in, uh, in Conseguela where we do uh, vaccination, nutritional supplements, bed nets, and general follow-up. And since 2012, we've, we've been implementing at district level, um, so outside of the, uh, in the five health areas, but also outside of them, uh, seasonal malaria chemo prevention, um, which is being transferred to the Ministry of Health this year. Um, we also do operational research. It's, it's our biggest pediatric project with transversal surveys, the, the RONI that I presented before, research attached to, C to SMC, um, antibiotic resistance, and PEAK, which we did in 2014. So what is PEAK? Um, it's portable eye examination kit. Uh, play on words from, from the ophthalmologist side. Uh, it was developed by LSHTM and Stuart Jordan and people at the University of Strathclyde to help in, in diagnostics um, for eye disease in low resource settings. Uh, basically what it is, it's a sleeve, and I'm sorry that I don't have a sample here, but it's a sleeve that adapts to a smartphone um, and that helps channel the light from the torch of the, of the smartphone and amplify the image uh, to give a, a, an accurate um, image of the retina, of the back of the eye. Um, there, there, it's, there's also a software part uh, with an app that serves as a, um, that serves as a database and also helps capture uh, image. Um, there have been trials in Kenya and in Botswana in use for adult eye care, mainly for, for diabetes care. So why, why would we need to use PEAK in, in MSF settings? Well, any tool that can help uh, more accurate diagnosis will be an interesting tool for, for us to use, especially if it's simple and if it can be a, a point of care tool. Fundus examination for all of us clinicians is something quite difficult. We learn how to do it in our residency or in medical school, and then we never use it because it's hard to do when it's um, <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to do, and we don't really know what we're looking at a lot of the times. Uh, <laughs> the, and the retina is an accessible window to what's going on in the brain. So a lot of the changes that we see in the retina is actually what's happening in the brain and allows us not to have to do a brain biopsy, which is not very plausible in our settings or in any settings for that matter. So this is how PEAK comes in. Um, we had a few of the sleeves here. Um, um, so, okay, so now to the malaria side. So what is malaria retinopathy? So in the late 90s, um, a group of clinicians and ophthalmologists saw uh, that in the, there were changes in the retina that happened in cerebral malaria. So the, the, the definition of cerebral malaria is, is a patient with a positive malaria test and coma that cannot be associated to anything else. As simple as this seems as a, as a definition, in the field, we find a huge range of, um, of conditions that get classified as cerebral malaria without us being able to really discern what was cerebral <coughs> malaria and what wasn't. So what they saw was that there were three main changes in the back of the eye that happened only in, uh, that were patho pathognomonic, so that happened only in people who had, in kids who had cerebral malaria. And these were hemorrhages, white, pat white patches, and abnormal vessels. So these are the hemorrhages, Quite easy to see here in, a, in these nice pictures. Um, so these pictures are taken with special cameras uh, and using quite expensive material that, of course, is not available to us in the field. Um, these are the white patches and also the hem hemorrhages. And in this one, you see abnormal vessels. If you're not trained in seeing these, it's not very easy to see, and especially not with the tools that we usually have. And if you have to look at it, um, you, you have to look at the patient's back of the eye uh, while the patient might be, might, while the patient's eye might be moving. You can only get a peek at that point in time and then try to assess what that, what, what you think, what you think you actually saw without being able to compare with any of your colleagues. So. What they saw uh, when they did the studies was that there were, there were some kids with cerebral malaria who didn't have these changes, 
uh, but that some that, that the other changes were quite uh, were present um, quite frequently and, and this obviously doesn't add up to a hundred but it's because some kids presented with more than one change so what's interesting with this is that they um, there is an association between the presence of these changes and the and the risk of mortality so in terms of prognosis it is quite a good um, tool to use so yeah so uh, 30, uh, 30, ooh, sorry, 36 percent. Okay, yeah, 36 percent of the kids with papilledema um, and malaria retinopathy uh, died. 15 percent with only malaria retinopathy um, ended up ended up dying, and 44 percent of the kids with papilledema ended up dying. <laughs> I will explain a little bit of papilledema if I have time at, at the end. Um, so yeah, so. Another study, this is more for the background, also showed that 25% of the kids who had been diagnosed with cerebral malaria and who died did not have cerebral malaria on autopsy, which means that maybe they could have been treated for another condition and they weren't because they, it was just assumed that they had cere cerebral, uh, cerebral malaria because they had a positive malaria test. This, was one of the, this is one of the algorithms, algorithms that was proposed after that study. Um, all of the cases, when they're positive for malaria, they're treated for, ma for malaria, but other causes will be looked at if there's no um, malaria retinopathy. So now coming to our study, what were we trying to do? So we were trying to see whether using PEAK as a tool, as a simple, ready-to-use tool um, by non-ophthalmologist clinicians was as uh, sensitive and as specific as using the uh, binocular indirect ophthalm ophthalmoscopy, which today is the gold standard, and which is a tool that's used by ophthalmologists. Um, relatively, relatively expensive, but not only that, it's quite difficult to, to use and difficult to have in the field. Uh, we did this in, in Mali, where we have, in, in the hospital, where we have approximately 2,000 cases of cerebral malaria diagnosed per year, mostly during the, the malaria season. Uh, we had 61 inclusions. We did this in, in 2014, had 61 inclusions. Uh, and we were trying to validate PEAK as a, as a tool. We were also trying to assess what training needs the non-ophthalmologist clinicians would need to be able to use PEAK. Uh, and then eventually think about other potential uses of PEAK if this was a feasible tool. So the inclusion criteria were kids from six months to five years presenting at the Kutiala District Hospital with either a coma or repeated convulsions that required um, administration of diazepam and were uh, assessing the coma scale was not, was not uh, possible. Uh, and with consent provided by a guardian. They did not need to have a positive malaria test because we were trying to see if the non-ophthalmologist clinicians would identify malaria retinopathy in kids that did not have malaria. And the exclusion criteria was kids that with hypoglycemia that, and, and coma that uh, resolved quickly after uh, administration of glucose. So all of the kids received, if they were positive for, for malaria, they received uh, injectable artesanate. Uh, and usually they receive ceftriaxone, which is uh, part of the of the guideline. We, today we give kids in a coma with a positive malaria test, treatment for malaria, and treatment for meningitis. Uh, the pupils were dilated, and then there was an examination done by Susan Lewallen, who's uh, one of the, who's the ophthalmologist who first ident first uh, described malaria retinopathy, and the two non-ophthalmologist clinicians. And data from Peak was registered in the app. And from bio, it was registered on, on paper and then all mixed up together. So this is Susan using the indirect ophthalmoscope. It's this device that she's wearing on her head um, and plus a, a lens that she needs to use, needs to use in her hand. She, whatever she can see, only she can see and it can't be compared with, no, no other colleague can have a peek at what, peek, at what, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry for that, uh, at, what she's, at what she's looking. Um, and this is her doing, this is when we were doing the training um, and looking at PEAK and having the other, the, the, uh, the other doctors look at what she's looking. And it's also recorded so we can look at it afterwards. Uh, so the results, which you can't really see, um, I can see it here, uh, are this, the, this is the, these are the sensitivity results. So this is clinician number one and this is clinician number two. They received a two and a half day training um, and this is the sensitivity that we found comparing their, their outcomes with uh, those of Susan's, and that's the specificity. So quite, oh, great, 
quite high uh, specificity and sensitivity above 80%, which for people who have never looked at the back of the eye before is pretty good. Um, so uh, c continuing with the results, when, c when comparing, and that was for all types of malaria retinopathy. When we compared each one individually, the, the, e the highest agreement was on the hemorrhages, which is probably the easiest to see. Uh, papilledema, which we were hoping would have a better result because then it would help. Um, papilledema is a sign of uh, intracranial hypertension. So we thought if we can actually ident help identify this, it will mean that we can decide whether or not, it helps you decide whether or not um, you can do a lumbar puncture. So we thought if, if we get good results on that, we can also use it for clinical changes. Uh, but we didn't get very good results. Um, and the images are still being reviewed today by at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London for, for further assessment. And so we will have, we will refine the results a little bit more. So this is, well, this is not a test, but if anyone wants to shout out what they think they're seeing, uh, you can go for it. <coughs> That's the back of my eye. For, um, yeah, this is a video that we put together to try and show the rest of the clinicians in the hospital what was, what we were looking at, because everyone was very curious of what and what. So that's a normal eye, I hope. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a child's disc, which is also normal. One of the things that was very interesting is that we were also teaching or reviewing um, anatomy, which sometimes we forget about. So that's a hemorrhage which is quite easy to see now if you have the time and the, the time to, to look at it and to discuss with other colleagues. It might not be so easy to see if you have a couple of seconds. You also see that some, well, these are some of the, the, the hemorrhages and some whitening, which is not so easy to see. But when you can look at it after having looked at the child, it's, yep, there we go. Makes it a little bit easier right there. No, nobody's guessing. Um, it, it, was all, it also showed that it's, sometimes it's quite difficult. Some of these kids, they're in a coma, but they, they have quite a lot of nystagmus, so it's quite difficult to see, and at least this can capture it uh, for a longer period of time. And the vessels were the most difficult to see, but... Mm, yep, right. It's not, even, even with peak, it's not so easy to see. Right there, there we go. Okay. So... In, in conclusion, it seems like PEAK can be a good tool to improve um, our, our diagnosis. We've been talking a lot about data, but data is only going to be as good as whatever you introduce in it. So if we're making, if the clinicians are making a wrong diagnosis of cerebral malaria, we're going to think we have huge amounts or very little uh, cerebral malaria when, when we actually don't know what, what we're actually looking at. Um, it will not change the clinical management of cerebral malaria. Any child with a coma with a positive malaria test will still be treated with injectable artesanate and with, um, and with ceftriaxone. But it will help refine the diagnosis and help us talk, uh, the diagnosis and the prognosis, and help us communicate with the family and see what, we're, what we think we're seeing uh, and what we think the patient's outcome is going to be. And it can also help improve the epi follow-up of cerebral malaria, like I was saying before. If, we're, we're seeing in some of our projects with the introduction of some preventive measures that it seems like the proportion of cerebral malaria, malaria is increasing, which is what's one of the reasons why we did, why, why we did this study. Uh, we're not really sure if that's true or if that's just something, um, that's just what the, what the clinicians are, are diagnosing. So having tools like this that help refine our, our diagnostics will be, uh, will be of use in these, in these kind of follow-ups. Um, and we also found that the two-day initial training was insufficient and a four-day training would be, would be more appropriate and recommended. <laughs> and what's most interesting, I think, about this is that a PEAK seems to be a feasible tool for us to use in the field. So hopefully, uh, once, once the tool is available, we will be able to use it for uh, diabetes follow-up and for, for HIV and probably for more, uh, for more conditions in the future. And that's... It, I think so. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.